In 2003, there was a movie that came out called Anger Management. Has anybody, has anybody ever seen that movie? Raise your hand. If you put it on FX, like last week, it might have been on, because it's like one of those movies that seems to be on TBS like every three weekends. Um, but this movie called Anger Management, uh, it was with Adam Sandler. Uh, so we're going to kick off an Advent mission, quoting an Adam Sandler movie. It's going to be a different kind of Advent mission. So not only was, at, well, not only was Adam Sandler in it, the, uh, the other person, the other lead role, he played a psychologist. His name was Jack Nicholson. Um, so if you want to see a crazy movie, watch where the psychologist, the one who's supposed to know and like be sane, is Jack Nicholson. Uh, it's going to be a little bit crazy, right? So in this movie, though, there's a, the, the psychologist's name, his name is Buddy, and Adam Sandler's name, that was cool, but Adam Sandler's name in the movie is David. Uh, and David is just like this guy who's kind of going through life, he's kind of letting life pass him by, and things get him angry, right? Anger management, name of the movie, but things get him angry, and he does nothing with it. He just kind of bottles it up, he doesn't really say much, and through a kind of crazy, backwards series of events, he finds himself in court and the judge says, you have to go to anger management, but not anywhere, to this doctor. And it's Jack Nicholson. It's Dr. Buddy. So in the, movie, in the movie, David shows up at his first anger management meeting and sure enough, there's like bad stale coffee, some uh, stale cookies, right? And everybody's sitting in a circle and they're doing their talk and there's all kind of crazy characters and it's really funny. Uh, and at one point, there's a moment in the movie, there's like this key moment where Jack Nicholson, where, the, where Dr. Buddy looks at David and he says, so Dave, tell us about yourself. Who are you? And he kind of sits back and he's like, uh, I'm an executive assistant at a major pet product company. And he gets interrupted. Like, it's like, man, I was, I was answering your question. And he says, no, 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 no. Dave, I don't want you to tell me what you do. I just want to know who are you. He sits back and he says, well, I'm a, I'm a pretty good guy. Um, I play tennis on occasion. And again, he gets interrupted. No, no. Those are your hobbies. I just want to know who you are. Now the frustration's kind of building up, and you can see where the movie's going to kind of derail in a moment, but he gets a little bit upset, and he's like, well, I don't really know how you want me to answer this question. Um, maybe someone else here can tell me uh, what a good answer looks like. So like you, how about you? And Dr. Buddy sits back and he says, wait, wait, wait. You want Lou to tell you who you are. And everybody kind of laughs, and he becomes the butt of the joke. And then afterwards he says, no, uh, I guess I'm an easygoing man. Uh, I kind of be indecisive at times. And again, he cuts him off and says, that's your personality. Who are you? From there, the movie just kind of goes on to left field, and he gets mad, and there's a little bit of an argument, and that's where it becomes funny, of course. But those questions that he lays out there from the very beginning of this conversation, I think is pretty telling. Who are you? Like, if you had to, if you had to answer that question yourself, think about it. How would you answer that? Who are you? Like, if you had to put your whole person, everything that you are, everything about you, every nuance, every personality trait, your job, the whole nine yards, if you had to make it one sentence, how would you answer the question, who are you? I know in my life, and throughout the course of my life, I would have answered that a lot of different ways, depending on the stuff going on in my life, right? When I was an elementary school student, it would have been like, who are you? I'm going to be a baseball player. Like, that's, that's how I would have answered it. Uh, as a high school student, it's like, who are you? I'm the bad kid around St. Hillary. Um, if you would have fast forward a little bit more, who are you? When I was in college, it's like, I'm like the king of the student section, right? If you would have continued to go through all these different things, like the identity that we put on ourselves tells us a lot about us. 
Because when I was a kid, I loved baseball. When I, was, when I was in a youth group here, I was kind of a troublemaker. And when I was in college, I never missed an LSU football game. Amen, hallelujah, oh yes, right? But the way I answer that question says something about me. So if someone proposes to you the question today, who are you, how would you answer it? Like, I think that's what tonight is all about is for us to get in touch with how would I answer, how do I know who I am? Because sometimes what ends up happening is we follow the same pattern that David did in the movie. Like the first thing we want to kind of lean on is my job. Or the hobbies that I have. Well, and we know this all too well around here, what happens whenever the job doesn't exist anymore? What happens when our hobbies and our interests kind of change, or the people we're with, they kind of like change their mind and want to do something else? There's like an identity crisis that sinks in. Because if that's who I am, but that no longer happens, then, then what? What? The next thing I think we do a lot of times, just like he did, is we start looking to other people to tell us who we are. Who are you? Oh, well, I don't know, but my buddy, he may know. He always tells me that I'm really funny, so I must be the funny guy. Oh, uh, uh, someone else has been telling me that I'm really smart, so I must be the smart person. Someone else tells me that I'm really good at this or that I do that well. I must be those things. The thing is, is that if we continue to base that answer to that question on what everybody else says, then what ends up happening is, if I'm the funny guy, I've got to be the funny guy all the time. And all of a sudden, my life stops becoming a life and starts becoming a performance to those around me. Because I'm supposed to be the funny guy. All of a sudden now, if I'm the smart one, then I can't just be smart for the sake of being smart and liking to learn. It's I have to prove how smart I am, so I've got to be the know-it-all. See, the way we answer that question has to be rooted in something more than just what we do, something more than just what other people say about us, something more than even what we think is our personality and makes us unique. The answer to who we are has to be something actually foundational and strong and lasting. And I think what happens a lot of times is when we start looking for that, we got to go deep. Like we've got to go back like deep into the recesses of our heart where only God is sitting there telling us who we are and we've got to listen. And that's hard. I think a lot of times that is a hard thing to do is to be able to retreat into ourselves because sometimes we don't like the person that we might come in contact with. But we can, tra- we can go back. And I think that's what tonight, that's what the theme of tonight is going to be about is let's answer that question of who I am. Let's answer that question that can stump us at times, that can give us a bunch of answers that don't really matter. Let's rewind, let's dig deep, and let's go to that space where only God can talk to us. Like the deep foundation, the strong foundation that everything else can be built upon. Let us look for something that's going to satisfy the answer to that question of who are you? One of the places that we can go, now, now one thing I do want to mention before we start this, that it's going to take, as we're, as we're speaking, as we're looking at ourselves, as we're going back to who we are in God's image and likeness, who we were created to be in God's image and likeness, there is a space in there that it's, we got to be a little bit vulnerable with God. So tonight, like, that's why we're coming to adoration. That's why we're coming to confession. That's why there's a space for us in a church tonight, that we can sit back and we can reflect on ourselves and not be afraid. We know we do it with the Lord. Amen? So it may take a little bit of vulnerability. 
It may take a little bit of letting go, but it's going to be a, only, the only reason why we do this is so that God can speak His healing into our lives. Amen? Okay. So we can rewind back. If we're going to look at who we are, we've got to start with who was man created to be. I think that's a good place to start. If we're going to start the story, let's start the story right at the beginning. All right? So we're looking right there, Genesis. And on the sixth day, God created man, and he was very pleased. Now, when he creates everything else in the universe, when he creates light and darkness, the land and the sea, when he creates the whole rest of the cosmos, he looks back, he steps back and says, I'm pleased. But when he creates man, he's very pleased. He creates everything and says that it's good. But when he creates man, he looks at it and says, it's very good. So from the very beginning, from from who we are, the very, very core of our being, when we look at ourselves before God, before anything else, he's pleased when he looks at us. Now that already might be something that's absolutely shocking. Because you know what? I know what my history looks like. I know what my background looks like. I know the, I know the person that I was before. I know the person I am when I sin. And God still looks at all of that and He says, I'm pleased. Like already, we can stop the talk, go to the Lord, and just pray about that. Don't worry, I'm not gonna... <laughs> Well, the PJ would probably kill me if I would. <laughs> He'd be very pleased. No, um, he wouldn't be very pleased, right? But for us, if we can stop right there and just reflect on that for a moment, that when God looks at human beings, when he looks at each one of us, not just mankind generally, but when he looks at you, he says, I'm very pleased. We fast forward a little bit in the scriptures. Then the Lord formed a man out of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils and breathed life and man became a living being. So not only is God, is God pleased with human beings, but He gives a gift. He gives that first gift of life to us. He breathes into the dirt. Like God creates us from nothing. He creates everything we see out of nothing. He grabs dirt, spits in it, blows on it, and all of a sudden, it's Adam. The way that God can pull from nothing and bring life shows how powerful He is and and the fact that He does it in a way that we get life reveals to us that guess what? He loves us. And He wants to find someone to love. Like God is love. He wants someone to love. Someone to receive it. That's why He creates us. Because we can't love without someone receiving it. We continue. The Lord then took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. So after he gives man, and he looks at man, and he sees that man is good, after he's very pleased with man, after he gives man life, the next thing he does is he gives him a place. He gives him a place in the world. And if we continue to read, not only does he give him a place, but he gives him the food and the sustenance that he's going to need to live. So God is now, not only is He looking at us and saying He's pleased, not only is He looking at us and saying, here's life, this mysterious, beautiful thing that we have before us, right? He's also looking at us and saying, I'm going to provide for every need you have. Now we're looking at Adam, and like Adam is like, man, this is awesome. This is like the best Christmas ever. I got life, I got a place, I got food. Man, this is awesome. I don't need clothes because that ain't started yet. Like, this is awesome, man. God, Adam is sitting in a space where he is just receiving from the Lord and continuing to receive from the Lord. And it's beautiful. And he knows his God and his God knows him. But there's still one thing within Adam that's kind of like, ugh, I'm lacking. There's one thing more that I seek, Father. Father. Like, there's one more thing that I need. 
and he was alone. So God gives him, puts him to sleep, takes out his rib, again, spit, blow, boom, woman. That's exactly how it happened, actually. Spit, blow, boom, woman. That's, that's how it came about. Um, I, I, it was an epiphany from the Lord that showed me a spit, boom, it was spit, breath, boom, woman, and that's, that's how it came about. And what happened was is that the crown of creation is created. A woman now is there with Adam, and he sees her. It says, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This is the one that completes me. My existence now makes sense in light of her. So God makes a point. Not only is He very pleased, not only does He give life, not only does He say, I'm going to give you a place and sustenance and I'm going to provide for you, but He also says here, I'm going to give you a companion to live in communion with. You and her and me all together. You and him and me all together. In perfect communion. Now I know in our lives that doesn't that's not that's not how we always feel. Like that's awesome. Great. Father JD, that's great. That's awesome. I know that's in the Bible, but that's like whenever they were naked and they didn't have clothes and like it was all kind of weird things going on. I, I, I understand, but that was a long time ago. But I think for, for us, it does communicate something. Like we see in the Scripture that just God gives. He's very generous in what He's giving to us. I mean, He provides. He's very generous in just offering up a space and food and shelter and everything that they need. Right? And if He's able to do that, all that for them, there's a reason why He must do all that for them. Like there's a reason why He must for some reason Focus on man as the one I'm going to do that for. Because he doesn't do that for like a giraffe. He doesn't do that for like a hippo, right? He doesn't do that for like a tree or rocks or the ground or something else. He only does that for, his, for mankind. He only does that for us. Right? And that's because God, as I said, is compelled by love to say, I'm in relationship with you. I love you. And I want nothing to happen to you. Like, this story is amazing. But this story is not our reality today. Like, this story is awesome. And that's beautiful. And that's how we were created to be. And this is the mystery of creation and how it's supposed to look in the world. Absolutely. And if it's resonating in our hearts of like, man, that's awesome. That would be great. It's because we miss it. It's because we want to go back to that. It's because deep down in our hearts, we know we're created to be in that perfect communion with God. To let Him provide for us. We know this life that He's blessed us with is not supposed to end. We know the communion between man and woman is supposed to be something that's fruitful, that multiplies but that's not it. That's not what it feels like today. But we know who we were. And who, we're, who we were created to be. And then enters, excuse my French, that damn snake. Then enters the tempter then enters the one who wants nothing more than to divide. The serpent looks at, looks at Eve and says, are you sure? Are you really sure that God said not to eat of that tree? Because from creation, they had no problem. They're like, great, I got all these other trees. I don't need that one. That one's fine with that. That's good. I'm living my life. But it wasn't until someone took Eve and basically turned her face and said, stop looking at him and start looking at the tree. Are you sure that he said not to eat of that tree? 
wasn't enough to come out and say, you should go eat of that tree. It was just enough to start questioning. It was just enough to start to turn her face a little bit from the Lord and say, are you sure that He said not to eat from that tree? Then He doubles down. And this is where He becomes the father of lies, right? Then He says, look, God doesn't... Uh, well, absolutely, we're not supposed to eat of that tree. Well, God doesn't want you to eat, not eat of that tree because it's going to kill you. No. No. God doesn't want you to eat of that tree because you're going to be like Him. Man, I never thought of that. Man, I never thought. Like, He created everything. He was this powerful to create this entire garden. All this food. All this life that I have within me. He was powerful enough to do all of this. Man, you mean I could be able to do that too? Adam, you, you, we could be able to build this. And it's just enough for them to take a bite. It's just enough where, where we step out and we try to be something that we're not. And we fall. If we look at it, what's the result of sin? The same way that the fruit of creation with God, right, was all these wonderful things. What's the result of sin? We start to question His goodness. We start to question our goodness. That, that proclamation that this day, the stuff we created, the people we created were very good. Well, I don't know if I am now. What's the more results of sin? That life that we were blessed with, that we were given, it introduces death into our world. What's the result of sin? Now, we have a struggle for, fulfill for fulfillment. Adam is going to bring about fruit from the ground by the sweat of his brow instead of an open gift from the Lord. That weeds and thistles are going to grow up with the fruit. And it's not going to be just a generous gift anymore, but rather there's going to be a struggle to fulfill the desires that you need. And lastly, there's going to be division. There's going to be division, not only, not only in the world, where all the animals were living in peace, but there's going to be division even in the home that will turn husband against wife Daughter against mother. Father against son. Daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. All those are in the Scriptures later on. The division gets introduced into the world as a product of sin. As a product of trying to be something that we're not. From our first parents. You know, when, when, when Eve was going to reach for the fruit, when there was this moment in the Scriptures, now, I say Eve, but like Adam and Eve are both at fault here, right? What ends up happening a lot of times, people are like, oh, well, it's Eve's fault. Well, it's Adam's fault. Adam should have been there. Well, Eve shouldn't have grabbed it and all this other stuff. People want to read into it. The problem is, is that both of them failed. Amen? Both of them had a problem. And by, by trying to blame one or the other, it's just, it's just symptomatic of that division that was sown way back when. The division between man and woman, wife and, wife and husband. Where it's always the other one's fault and never mine. If we look at Scripture though, when there was this moment when, they saw, when, when their eyes were taken off of God and they're looking at the fruit, right? There's this moment where we hear... So when the woman saw the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was a and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, 
And she also gave some, some to her husband. That threefold, that threefold thing about the fruit, right? It was good for food. It was a delight to the eyes. And it was desired to make one wise. That threefold, one, two, three, right? That three things about this fruit is something that we call the threefold temptation of the garden. And in that threefold temptation of the garden, we see the threefold concupiscence, or the three, the three ways that we are led into sin in our lives most of the time. It was good for food. We call that, we call that the lust of the flesh. The lust of the appetites. So as we, as we consider these, maybe just in your own heart, in your own mind, asking the Lord, Lord, where is it that I fall into sin most commonly? Like, where is it in my own life that I fall into sin, that I fall into these places, that these places have a stronghold on me or they're a weak point in me? Where is it that, that tempter, that damn snake... <laughs> comes and whispers those words of temptation to me. The first being the, the lust of the flesh. It was good for food. I mean, in all of our hearts, there's a division of how I'm supposed to love those around me and how I may act that out. Where love is all about self-gift and self-donation and making myself small for the sake of the other and laying down my life and lust is all about grabbing and taking for my own fulfillment. That may be something that's sexual, that may be something that's of greed or gluttony, or with food, whatever it is, I take for my own fulfillment instead of giving for the sake of the other. The food was a delight to the eyes. I look at something not for its proper, its proper role or in its proper dignity, but I look at something out of use. I look at something because I'm about to use it for my own good. I suck out all the good that I can for my own pleasure and not for its sake. Whatever it is or whoever it is. Can you see where these introducing these two things, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, how that would completely destroy the communion that Adam and Eve shared? How division would be brought into the world and all of a sudden, the communion they had is broken. Or better yet, the communion they had is offended. That the communion, that, that way of which they just showed themselves fully and totally to one another, that trust is gone. And lastly, that the food was desired to make one wise. This threefold lust, the last of which the worst, the last of which the most fundamental, the last of which compelled this whole thing to happen where all of a sudden there's a pride of life that I can do what only God's meant to do. There's a pride of life that I desire to be wise above my means. I desire to be wise and be another God. You know, in our church tradition, we have a bunch of different things for different seasons and during, through the course of the year. We've got a bunch of beautiful things for Easter and for Christmas. We've got a, a bunch of awesome readings and things that we go through throughout ordinary time. But during the purple seasons, right, during Christmas and during Lent and during Advent, these are supposed to be moments of preparation for us. And during Lent, one of them that it seems like we continue to go back to over and over and over again is this idea of fasting, prayer, and almsgiving as just a means where I'm going to offer myself to the Lord. I'm going to ask for healing in these three places in my life. Well, this threefold lust, fasting, prayer, and almsgiving, the way in which God calls us to, 
like as an antidote to the lust of the flesh, is fasting. I don't, I'm not gonna, not only am I not gonna take what's not mine, not only am I gonna use something for my own good, or what, what I think is my own good at its expense, not only am I gonna like use, but instead I'm gonna give and I'm gonna give up. I'm gonna deny myself of something. When it comes to the lust of the eyes, so we have fasting, right? When it comes to the lust of the eyes, not only am I not going to just seek out something for my good, but I'm going to seek out the Lord more in a deeper prayer life to undo that lust of the eyes. And then lastly, the pride of life. Not only am I going to not put myself on God's level, but I'm going to even give the little bit that I have to those who are lesser than me. Not only am I going to not let pride take over and me put myself above other people, but I'm going to support them in any way I can. Materially, financially, whatever it is, I'm going to support them and give up, give to them. See, we're all called as Christians, like this is a way, this fasting prayer and almsgiving is supposed to be the threefold way that we start to work back in communion with the Father that He had for us when in Eden, in the garden, with Adam and Eve. The this, this same God that was providing for, uh, for Adam and Eve for so long, Right, this same God who was providing and giving and giving, that was bringing about fruit, that was giving shelter, that was giving everything in Eden before the fall, that same God now, there's an element of suspicion thrown on him. I don't know if he's going to do it. He kicked us out of the garden. I don't know if he's going to do it anymore. And I find that's where oftentimes we find ourselves. Like God, I don't know if you're going to do it. Like, God, I, look, I understand you got a bunch of problems throughout the world that things are falling apart overseas and that all this stuff's going on, but I'm sorry, in my life, I need you. Like, whether it's somebody that's sick in my family, a marriage who feels like it's falling apart, I'm in school and I don't know which way's up and I don't know what the next step's supposed to be. Like, like look, Lord, I understand you're busy with everything else, but I need you. I need you right now. As we sang at the, beginning of the, at the beginning of tonight, like, I need you, Lord. Where are you? I understand all these things are going on and everything's falling apart, but I need you. I think when we approach God with that, with that mentality, a lot of times we don't think, we don't take the time to look in and see where's my own sin? What places have I fallen, fallen short? What places, Lord, am I falling into lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, this pride of life, these things that are keeping me away from You? And instead, we approach Him with an element of suspicion. He's not going to answer. No matter how loud I yell. When Jesus came, when Jesus came to the earth, when He became man, he did it for a reason. He did it to remind us of who Adam and Eve knew who God was from the beginning. He came to remind us of all that was lost and to restore it. Like Jesus Christ came into this world not for the sake of just being like a cool guy that walked around with a robe and 12 friends. Right? He didn't want to just do miracles with, with fish and bread and feed a bunch of people. Jesus Christ came into this world so that you and I tonight in, at St. Hilary in Matthews, Louisiana will understand that we're not separated from God. That we're not apart from Him. 
Like that God, despite whatever it is in our life that's standing in the way, whatever sin, whatever struggles, whatever peace in our life is keeping us away from Him, that He's still just as close as He was to Adam and Eve so long ago. That He's still waiting for us. That He's still with us. And that He still is calling us His children the same way He did so many years ago with Adam and Eve. God is still looking at each one of us the same way He looked at Adam and Eve. The problem is is that sin has just gotten in the way and we don't feel it. He's still just as close as He ever was to His creation. And what happens is, is we get distracted. He still looks at us and says, you're very good, I want to provide for you, I want to give you a place. And all those promises that He made in the early part of the world, and we've just forgotten who we are. When Christ came to the earth, his famous, his, one of His most famous of all Scriptures, one of His most famous of all parables, was whenever He showed us how it is that we're supposed to relate to God. In the 15th chapter of Luke, we hear about the prodigal son. We hear about this younger son who had everything he could ever imagine. Sounds like Adam and Eve, right? Has everything he could ever imagine and looks at his father and says, I want my inheritance and I want to go. I want my cut and I want to leave. Now him doing that is essentially he's wishing his father dead. I'm done. I'm out. And he leaves. Fine. Go. The son goes off to this distant land and he's living it up and a famine hits and all of a sudden all the money that he had he loses. And he goes from living it up and being this playboy of sorts in this foreign land to now all of a sudden serving pigs. Now in a Jewish tradition, we've got to understand the pig is the lowest of all creatures. There was a taboo with pork. You didn't touch a pig. You didn't get near a pig. And this man was a servant of a pig. So he's the lowest of the low. There's a moment in his life where he looks and he says, you know what? My father's servants, the people living in my dad's house, are eating better than me. They're doing better than me. They're living better than me. Maybe I could go and just beg to get back into his good graces. Maybe I can go and just ask and beg and plead, and maybe he would make me a servant at least. So he does. He gets his stuff and he starts on his way home. The whole way home, he's rehearsing his lines. Kind of like when you knew you had to apologize and you'd rehearse your lines your whole way home, right? He just, he knew he had to apologize and he wanted to do it right. So, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. Please make me one of your servants. Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. Please make me one of your servants. He just keeps saying it, keeps saying it. And he comes in, he's getting closer to home. The way the Scripture reads, it says, while he was still a long way off, the Father saw him. Now, if I've got any hunters here, you know that if something is a long way off, if you're going to see that buck that's a long way off coming across the horizon, you better be looking for it. And it says, while he was still a long way off, he saw him and ran to him. I can only imagine that the Father, every day from the moment his son left, was sitting there waiting and just staring at the horizon. And the moment he saw him come across, he went out to get him. The moment he saw him come across, he's like, that's my son, and goes. And when he gets close, the son looks at him and starts to grovel, Father, I've sinned against heaven and you. And the father looks at him and says, shut up. You're not my servant. You'll never be my servant. You're my son. So come in. 
and we're throwing a feast because my son has returned. From the moment that the, that the fruit was eaten of in the Garden of Eden, God was already ready to plan for the incarnation. He was already planning for Christmas. He already knew from the moment that Adam and Eve fell that He was going to redeem them. And that He was going to do it in a special and holy and fully, full way. Holy not H-O-L-Y, holy W-H-O-L. Right? A complete way He was going to redeem them. And how was He going to do it? He was going to send His Son to be one of us. He was going to send His Son to be like the creature that He loved the most. He was going to send His Son to remind us of who we are. That before we're anything else, we're sons and daughters of the Father. That before we're anything else, We belong to God. St. Augustine once wrote, or once preached in a homily, speaking out to to the faithful, right? He said, you would have suffered eternal death had He, Jesus, not been born in time. Never would you have been freed from sinful flesh had He not taken Himself to the likeness of sinful flesh. You would have suffered everlasting unhappiness had it not been for this mercy. You would have never returned to life had He not shared your death. You would have been lost if He had hastened to your aid. You would have perished had He not come. Brothers and sisters, when we're going through Advent, a lot of times it just seems like the purple period right before Christmas or the shopping season. When we're going through Advent, we're talking about that redemption, that hope of everlasting life coming into the world where God takes flesh and comes to you and I. And in doing so, He reminds us of the dignity that we have. He reminds us of who He created us to be. He reminds us of who He still sees us as. He reminds us of who we are. So tonight, as we come to, as we come to this, this place, as we come to a space of like standing before the Lord, looking at Him face to face, of seeing Jesus now, not as a man walking around in front of us, but taking flesh on the altar, looking like a piece of bread, <laughs> As we come before the Lord, we don't come just to sing a couple of songs or to just kneel down because like we're supposed to. But we come to come face to face with the one who reminds us deep in the core of our being who we are and who we, who we were created to be. God desires us. God desires you no matter if you've got every sin in the book. Ultimately, He just wants you. He doesn't care what you've done. How you define yourself. He doesn't care what other people say about you. Very simply, God wants you. God wants to remind you of who He created you to be. He wants to remind you of who you are. So as we come before the Lord tonight, as we come before Him vulnerable, letting go of all of the labels that we've come to define ourselves as, Let us just sit and gaze before, gaze upon Him. Come face to face with the God who loves us so much. Face to face with the God who proclaimed that we are very good. Face to face with the One who wants to provide. The One who loves us. Let us come to experience God as the loving Father that He is so that we may know 
before all else that we're His children.